Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thanks for joining me. Now that I've talked about these control mechanisms that affect the timing of breeding in a population, what is controlling the timing of an individual doe and when she comes into to estrus and when she is ready to breed? That's an interesting question and it all comes down to hormonal factors. White-tailed deer are what we call short day breeders. They tend to breed when there are short days, not when there are long days. And lengthening nighttime stimulates the activation of a hormonal system that produces melatonin. The melatonin stimulates the hypothalamus to start producing hormones. Now, this is not a class in reproductive physiology. I'm showing you this flow chart to emphasize a couple of things that there are a lot of moving parts physiologically within a female timing of her reproduction. You have the hypothalamus responding to changes in melatonin production, which is responding to the increasing length of the nighttime. The hypothalamus produces gonadotropic releasing hormones. The gonadotropic releasing hormones act on the anterior pituitary, which is another hormonal producing area at the base of the brain. That anterior pituitary produces FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone. It produces luteinizing hormone, indicated by LH. Those hormones travel through the blood supply and activate the ovary. The ovary produces estrogen and progesterone at different times, and those activate uterus to prepare it to accept a fetus. And so it's a, a pretty extensive process of hormonal priming of different glands to produce hormones which have effect on other glands and produce further effects down the road physiologically. And so again, it's, this is not a physiology class. I want you to just understand that there's a lot of moving parts in determining when an individual doe are going to breed. And because there's all these moving parts that are dependent upon one or another of a previous part, a short-term shift in environment cannot possibly impact this complex physiological process. And so sudden weather changes, for example, the temperatures drop dramatically and you have some cold weather. The hunters say, well, the does came into estrus because it got cold. And I'm here to tell you that's not correct. You might be seeing a lot more activity on your property because there's a cold snap, but does on your property didn't come into estrus because it got cold. The physiological process taking place that determines when an individual doe is going to be enter estrus is something that's been happening and developing within her over a couple of months time period. When the doe is actually going to come into heat and be standing and receptive to a male, for mating is called estrus or heat and that's going to last about 24 perhaps as long as 48 hours in white-tailed deer. Once she's been bred they may decide to take a break and relax for a while and that's what's probably taking place in this photograph. She will be bred multiple times during her estrus and probably by more than one male during that estrus period. And we'll talk some more about that later. But if she's not successfully bred, white-tailed deer are seasonally polyesterous, which means a female will repeat her cycle until successfully bred or a change in the photo period ends the breeding season. Now, when does the male come into breeding season? Well, that's under the control of testosterone. During March, we have a small short-term increase in testosterone in a male. And that is associated with the initiation of antler growth. And then testosterone shuts off during the antler growth period. Testosterone levels increase dramatically 
late in the antler growth period, more in August and in September, we have this large increase in testosterone levels. And throughout this time period, testosterone remains high and from September through January, perhaps into February, testosterone levels are very high. He has hardened antlers during this time period and he is capable of breeding. Testosterone levels drop precipitously at the end of the breeding season and when this testosterone level drops it actually allows a set of cells at the base of the antler to become active and degenerate the bone that's connecting the antler to the skull and the antler falls off. This lower picture of Lucky you see a, the top of the pedicle is bleeding because the antler has literally just fallen off of Lucky and it's basically an open wound and that wound has to start healing just like when you cut yourself that wound is going to bleed and then it's going to start healing and five days later you see Lucky's wound is now healed and there's a scab uh, developed and then that scab is going to be replaced by actively growing tissue growing in from the edge of the scab and over about a, a one month period that scab is going to get smaller and smaller and the antler is going to start growing out from top of the pedicle or the base of the antler. This photo of Lucky taken on June 3rd, the scab has long since fallen off and he is actively growing his antlers. And at this time period there is very minimum levels of testosterone in his body. The antlers are actively growing. July 24th we took this picture and we see by early September he's produced all of his remaining antler growth. So there's a lot of antler growth taking place and antler mineralization taking place during this June, July, and August into early September time period. And then we have velvet shedding and it's really a, about a day, maybe two days total time period during velvet shedding. It is the width of it in this figure is only because I needed to put in the words velvet shed. It's actually a very short time period and in a, about a 24 hour period Lucky went from hardened antlers covered with velvet to hardened bone and this photo was taken September 25th right after he shed and you can see if you look close on the antlers you see dried blood if you look at his ear tags you can see dried blood on his ear tags and if you look to his to the right of the photo his left antler you can see some dried velvet hanging off of his antler so this is the antler cycle and when he is in hardened antler he is able to breed if he has testosterone levels high enough to have hardened antler on his head he is capable of breeding I'm going to walk you through one of these and show you what happens as Doc grows his antlers via our YouTube channel. You can see in early in the growth process in May he's he's slowly expanding the size of his antlers but not a lot not a lot's taken place. But then when you get into June that rapid antler growth takes place. A lot happening during July. It's making some dramatic growth. You see some drop tines developing on each side of his antlers during July. Mid-August, most of his growth is taking place and mineralization is taking place at this point. But then something happened to Doc. Something startled him and he hit the fence and he broke his drop tine off on his right antler. But you can see by October he's shed his velvet, early October. That's an example. If you want to see Meatball, you're welcome to look at him at your own, on your own time. So we now know that a buck, if he has hardened antlers, is capable of breeding. Now, why do bucks have antlers? One major reason is that they are used as a weapon during male-to-male -male competition. They are fighting for an opportunity to be dominant and that with that dominance comes an opportunity to do the breeding. That's really really important and you may have seen a fight taking place 
If not, then you had the opportunity to see some rubs and some scrapes. And these are communication methods. Bucks are saying, I'm here, I'm around. The point of these rubs and scrapes is indicating the potential for breeding. They are not an indicator that breeding activity is taking place. And so when you see the, the greatest amount of rubs and scrapes being made, that's actually prior to the peak of actual breeding. But when breeding is actually taking place, when the does are in estrus, the bucks are not making rubs and scrapes. So the actual prevalence of rub and scrape making decreases during the peak of breeding. And if you've never seen breeding take place, I'm going to give you an opportunity to see that from our MSU Deer Research Unit. It's a short video. We have two adult bucks and, and they both have antlers on at this point. We hadn't had a chance to remove them from these particular bucks. You see a doe that is coming into estrus or is in estrus and she is now standing for breeding. We see the orange tag buck here. He's mounted her. He's preparing to breed her. He's getting ready. She's standing for him. She's ready to be bred. He's trying to get ready. He's trying. He's almost ready. And there he's bred her. It's a relatively quick activity. And now we have this other buck that's in the same pen with the orange tag buck. Orange tag buck just bred her and, and he's kind of satisfied and he's actually allowing the doe to be bred by his pen mate, this other buck in the in the pen, and he's just bred her. So you see this doe being that's allowing herself to be bred by two different bucks and she's actually going to be able to allow herself to be bred multiple times by each of these bucks. And in this case there's not a clear dominance hierarchy between the two. They're kind of sharing the opportunity to breed this doe. Now if you notice to the right side of the video in another pen, an adjacent pen, there's an adult buck that's already had his antlers removed and he's rather envious because he does not have an estrus doe in his pen so he's very interested in what's happening in the adjacent pen and we're going to see some interesting buck to buck interactions in just a moment. I'm going to shut up and let you listen to them. hear that hear that grunting so you've just observed some interesting deer behavior that you may have not have ever seen in the wild now you've heard what a real buck grunt sounds like. And now you see some displacement behavior. These two bucks that a moment ago were allowing each other to breed the doe, but because one of the bucks got riled up by the neighboring buck, he got into a fighting mood and started fighting with the, his buddy. When preparedness meets opportunity, that's when breeding actually takes place. The buck is capable of breeding when he has hardened antlers. The doe is under a much more restricted control of her breeding. She is going to be in estrus for a 24 to 48 hour period and that's the only time she's going to breed when she is in standing estrus. I'm going to show you a doe that comes into estrus and is bred in December. Now the next day or the next week I show two does being bred. These are the early breeders in the deer population. And then a few days later, a couple more does come into estrus. And a few days later, a few more does come into estrus. And a lot more does are coming into estrus. And then you end up with this peak of breeding taking place as a majority of does within the population are in estrus. And then that peak of breeding starts subsiding 
as you have a decline in the number of does that are coming into standing estrus and can you see this bell-shaped curve similar to the bell-shaped curve I showed you earlier from Ashbrook Island and from the state of Ohio then there's some late breeding does and then I, sh I threw in a few cases here where you have some does that didn't take their first time and they recycle and breed the second time and that's often a second estrus. That's what happening with deer population when preparedness meets opportunity. The bucks are prepared to breed, they breed when the does come into estrus and the doe population has about a 45 day period within which 90% of the breeding takes place.